I'm going to call this meeting to order then. Welcome to this afternoon's meeting, everybody. Before we begin, um, I would like to take a few moments to honor two people who made con great contributions to WCC. William J. Davis Jr. and Dennis Billa. For over a decade, Mr. William J. Davis Jr. provided leadership and a firm commitment to lifelong learning at Washtenaw Community College. Mm -hmm. He was elected to the WCC Board of Trustees in 1992 and served as a treasurer and vice chair for two two-year appointments during his six-year term. He was appointed by the board to the Washtenaw Technical Middle College Board of Directors in 1999 and served as chair. He joined the WCC Foundation Board in 1998, where he served as chair of its corporate committee and established the Arbor Springs Scholarship. Mr. Dennis Billa started at the college in 1969 and during his tenure served with distinction as both a union leader and faculty member. Dennis was a long-standing member of the Washtenaw Community College Education Association and for several years served as its president. In addition to his faculty position, he also served as chair of the math department. After his retirement, he continued working with the college as a part-time math instructor. In 1999, Dennis was given the college's Morris J. Lawrence Award. Please join me in a moment of silence from former trustee, Mr. William Davis, and faculty member, Mr. Dennis Billa. Thank you, everybody, for that moment. Let's begin the meeting. Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming here. Vice Chair Milliken. <laughs> Milliken here. Treasurer Davis. Davis here. Davis, yes, 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 yes. Secretary Devardi. Devardi here. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher here. Trustee Landau. And out here. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton here. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Support, Milliken. Second. Thank you. Um, any discussion on the agenda before we could begin? Okay. Hearing none, this, Vanessa, I'm sorry, what was that? This is uh, McKnight Morton. Is it appropriate for me to uh, talk about the person who has Two people who have uh, deceased or wait until comments. Um, wait till comments. I, I would appreciate it if you'd wait till comments. Okay, no problem. Okay, That's thank, right. okay, okay th thank, thank you. you. Uh, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milligan. Milligan, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, Davis yes. Yes, yes, yes. Secretary Devardi. Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Moving to tab A, the minutes. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the minutes of the May 19th monthly meeting as submitted. Do I hear a motion for the minutes? So move. Hatcher, second. Thank you. Any discussion on the minutes? Okay, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. 
Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milligan. Milligan, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. 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 Secretary Devardi. Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moving on to citizen participation. First up is our verbal communication. Uh, Ms. Ms. Kissel, are you ready? I think so. I think they're going to start my video. Go ahead Maybe. when you're ready. Yep. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. There I am. All right. Well, it's June 2020. Um, in the month since the last board meeting, much has happened. Uh, and working with the VPI and Executive Director DeLong, the WCCA has signed a number of letters of agreement in preparation for the fall semester. Uh, among them, we have agreed to shift the timeline for completing yeah. professional development and capitalize on the summer training many of us plan to do. Uh, we've extended continuing adjunct status for the 2020-2021 school year so that no current adjunct loses their status due to changes related to the pandemic. And we've allowed for adjuncts to teach up to 10 credit hours, giving departments more flexibility in scheduling. And so this can only be done through our regular conversations with President Balanca, VPI Hearns, and others as we consider how best to meet the students' needs. Um, also, the WCCA is pleased to announce that we are encouraging donations to the foundation through the WCCEA Faculty Union Care Student Emergency Fund. Like the General Emergency Fund, these monies will support our students in their times of need, and happily, this fund is growing through one-time donations and payroll deduction. Of course, all are welcome to give to this fund, and I thank the WCCEA board and the members for their ongoing support. This month has also reminded us of the injustice and inequality in this country as we witnessed the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the subsequent protests locally and abroad. As noted by the MEA president, the WCCEA knows that our members, our institution, has a critical role to play in the education and the fostering of solutions. But I don't want these to just be empty words to this board. As my members have reached out over to me this past month, they want to know how to make an impact how to feel safe in promoting difficult conversations, and how to engage in the struggle in meaningful ways. I will continue to, to discuss this with President Blanca and BPI Hearns as the start of a new school year, an election year, provides us with such opportunity. Therefore, I was very pleased to see that President Blanca has joined with other colleges, uh, presidents and chancellors for the All In Campus Democracy Challenge. I look forward to learning more about how we can leverage this initiative on our campus. And of course, sadly, one voice in this conversation that will be missed is that of Dennis Bila, who passed away on June 9th. I never got to know Dennis well, but I hear him every time I open my contract. I've heard from many uh, over these past weeks uh, who've had a much greater sense of the man, and their stories show a person who had such great conviction, humility, tenacity, love, and humor. And as one faculty member noted, while not a man of great stature, he was indeed a giant. So on behalf of the WCCEA, we would like to extend our deepest condolences to his family and friends, and we will work to carry on his legacy of empowering others to make an impact on the world. Dennis made an impact on WCC, and for that, we will forever be grateful. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Kissel. Um, um, public comments, Vanessa, were there any public comments received? I uh, know there was no public comments. Um, any written communications? There was one received. Okay, thank you. Um, and you sent that on to us, right? Yep. Okay, all right. Okay, moving on to special reports. First up is the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholars. Uh, VP Hearns, are you ready? Yes, I am. Go ahead. So we're going to watch a video, and before uh, we watch that video, I just want to introduce two wonderful uh, students. Uh, both Emily and Maximilian are students who were chosen um, among 273 students who applied to join the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholars Program. Um, Emily um, is a 19-year-old. She recently com completed her pre-engineering science transfer associate's degree. She was a past president of the WCC Outspace Club and was deeply involved on campus in multiple other student clubs and organizations as a chemistry peer tutor and working in the college's writing center. 
um, Maximilian, um, along with taking a full schedule at WCC classes um, this upcoming fall 2020 semester, he will be also one of the scholars. He actually came to us from the University of Michigan where he was studying nursing and decided um, to shift gears. He's a 19 year old Ypsilanti resident and is the second WCC student, of course, to um, get this award. I think the other thing that I would like to note um, and kind of um, goes along with um, the earlier statement from Dr. Kissel is that um, the faculty members who have um, just open their arms to these students and help them in a lot of ways. Um, I'd love to call their names. Um, Susan Dentil, Danette Bull, Robert Haygood, Daniel Majis, Amir Fayez, and Sue Albach. Um, it was really nice to see the emails come in from the students thanking all of the faculty. Um, these faculty have worked together to really encourage and promote and motivate these students in a way I think is, um, is specific to how we do things at Washtenaw Community College. And uh, finally, I'll just also note that the faculty in the math, science, and engineering um, division have also made a $500 donation to keep alive the work that um, Aisha Bow, one of our alumni who you'll see in the video, has started when she was here for uh, STEAM Week. So without further ado, here's the video. In late May, our story about Emily Seghi was a big hit on social media. Emily is a recent WCC graduate transferring to the University of Michigan to study aerospace engineering, who learned she was accepted into the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholar Program. That story caught the attention of Aisha Bow. Aisha is a WCC graduate who transferred to the University of Michigan to study aerospace engineering and worked for NASA for seven years before starting her own tech company. We got them together. Yeah, so as soon as I saw the comment, um, more or less, I wrote an email to Aisha um, just explaining that she has been such a big inspiration and I'm, um, I'm entering on this similar path to NASA. And, um, you know, that the phone call was like i was a bit starstruck not gonna lie in like more ways than one because it's space you know <laughs> and um she she gave me some really valuable insight um being someone who has really forged this path um for for students like me Aisha is a strong WCC supporter who has returned to campus to participate in STEAM Week activities and last year endowed a scholarship through the WCC Foundation. And so when I saw the post, I literally screamed. I was so excited, Emily. I'm so excited for you. I'm excited for the school. I'm excited for the work that you're going to do. I'm excited for the journey that you're going to have because working at NASA and being part of that I mean, that environment is an absolutely life-changing and incredible experience, and I couldn't help but share that. Throughout her time at WCC, Emily carried the academic planner she posed with for our story. We asked her what it signifies. You know, the WCC sticker on my planner, um, you know, reminds me of, of where I'm coming from, um, this amazing support network that I have, and all of these people that I know and love. And the NASA sticker, really, it represents more than just NASA, but it is some of that self-belief, like just daring to dream about um, being at such, being part of such an important mission for humankind someday. Both challenge the stigma that community college students are behind their four-year university counterparts. In fact, they credit WCC for helping them reach their goals. My Washington Community College classes, which were affordable and fantastic and supportive, transferred to University of Michigan. So how can you beat that? How can you be taking a class that's on par with the classes that are offered from a top tier university at a fraction of the cost in a small environment and doing well in it. In, in a lot of ways, I feel like coming to WCC before going to U of M um, was the best thing I could have done for my education and my personal development. The friends you make and the mentors you meet, uh, they are just 
such a key support system in your academics as well. Um, and a lot of the professors at Washtenaw, in fact, I would say all of them, really, they, they are your cheerleaders. They want to see you win. They, they want to hear about your aspirations, why you came to WCC, where you want to go. And they want to do everything that they can to get you from point A to point B. Well, I've turned into a community college evangelist. At this point in time, I, I want more people to understand how powerful it is and to know that you know, going from high school to community college, getting a solid foundation, and then picking, I mean, literally picking where you want to go and your level of comfort with that and saving money, which is always a smart move, is the best thing you can do to set yourself up early on in your academic career. Before ending the call, we shared some more good news. Apparently we're starting a queue of uh, success stories to share because literally hours ago I learned um, that we have another student chosen for the Nassau Community College Aerospace Scholar Program that begins in September. So, we so have a club. we're gonna have a club, Rich? We a club? We're gonna have a club. So <laughs> I didn't have the opportunity to turn that around quickly enough and have him join us, um, but people can watch our news page, wccnet.edu backslash news, and um, you'll learn a little more about him very soon. So, but thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Did you have more um, comments on this VP Hearn? No? Okay, thank you. That was a great video. Thank you. Uh, next up is Report B, the Mandatory Audit Communication. Uh, VP Johnson, are you ready? I am, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, yep, it is uh, that time of year again uh, where we are starting to plan out our external audit for fiscal 20. And with us today is Tom Winkleman. He's the principal at Raymond. Uh, and Tom is going to go through for the board the mandatory communication and outline the planning uh, and execution schedule for our audit. So, Tom, are, are you ready? I am ready. Yeah, it's a, a really inspiring video to follow. Um, I know Emily and Maximilian are going go on to do great things, and I'll try my best here to <laughs> segue into the audit work. Uh, but as Bill said, it is that time of year. The fiscal year is winding down at June 30, and we're going to commence uh, that audit. So right now we're in the planning stages uh, of that audit. Uh, you, you might uh, recognize me. This is my second uh, year uh, in this role as engagement partner here. Uh, the last time you saw me was uh, delivering the final audit report uh, in the fall at the end of our work. So here we are uh, kicking off the audit um, and uh, we're, we'll mainly do that uh, starting here in June, July and again uh, later in the, in the fall before I'll report back to you at that time. Uh, just a couple of things as reminders. Um, I am an external auditor, and I report to you, the board. Uh, the board is is the um, is really the oversight uh, for the college, and I'm working for you, and I will report to you, and and that is my role. Um, as as an auditor, you know we'll conduct our audit in accordance with the professional standards, and uh, we're prepared and ready to do that. A uh, couple couple. Uh, things that we do as part of the audit. We audit the college itself as an entity. Uh, that, that should go as expected. The, uh, we also do a separate audit of uh, federal award money that flows uh, through, the, through the college. Um, that's primarily student financial aid, Pell Grants and the like that, that flow through the college. Uh, one interesting thing this year uh, that we'll, we're still getting new information on is some of the uh, federal money that's that's come uh, out of the pandemic, the you know the the uh, CARES Act and some other money that that has is flowing down from the federal government to the college. Uh, the guidance on that is still coming out on what we may or may not have to do in regard to that. But if we do get instructions like that, we'll incorporate that into our audit uh, as as required. 
Um, I kind of laid out in general our timeline. Um, so we'll, we'll conduct the audit generally uh, over the summer after the fiscal year ends and then come back at the end and, and describe the results and, uh, and of course communicate with the board if needed along the way, but we'd expect uh, to hold that traditional timeline. Uh, a lot of people have been asking, well, how are we gonna conduct an audit uh, in this, in this uh, pandemic type environment? And the good news is that CPA firms like ourselves, Raymond, you know, we, we're uh, very equipped and have been quite equipped for, for quite a while, you know, many years working uh, with technology to supplement uh, our, our efforts to communicate with management. And we have a history of working with uh, the WCC management uh, as needed and being flexible with technology. So I, I don't expect any disruption uh, really any changes um, we you know we'll, we'll, we'll be able to handle this uh, no problem. Of course we'd like to see everyone in person as much as possible as I'm sure each of you would too uh, but we're, we're ready to adapt to the environment and the conditions uh, that we have. Uh, the document you see on the screen you should have in your packet and I believe that you do there's an engagement letter which is the the formal um, agreement, if you will, which describes my role as an auditor and describes uh, management's role. And, and that's for, for your reference. Um, the, other, the other document that's sort of associated with that is, is our professional services plan. And that just lays out the timeline in a little bit more detail than I just verbally described. Um, so if you have any questions uh, on that along the way, my contact information is available. I'm sure many of you might have that anyway. Um, I look forward to serving the, the college again in this capacity and uh, working with the board here. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you uh, in person soon. Any questions? Um, any questions from the board or VP Johnson, did you wanna add anything here? Uh, just that uh, we we are even though we've we've been remote, um, our year end close process is uh, is not changing. We've already uh, batten that down. We have three internal closes that we do before we turn over the final year end results to Raymond, uh, and we fully anticipate being back to the board with a draft audit of financials at the September board meeting. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Ruth. Um, uh, Mr. Winkleman, um, how many times have you conducted the WCC audit? Yeah, th thanks for that question, Trustee Hatcher. Uh, this is my second time here as engagement principal. You might not recognize me with my uh, pandemic beard. I, I should have shaved it. Uh, but this is my second uh, time in this capacity here with the college. When did you do it before? Last year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from the board on the audit? Okay, thank you. Moving on to our next special report on the Police Academy update. Um, President Blanca, did you have some words of introduction here? <clears throat> I'm not hearing you, President Blanca. Are you, did you have something to say here? There we go. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, I'm muted. I'm muted. Um, I believe it's important for us to begin this conversation with a statement um, about our philosophy. And I, I wanted to share that before we have this conversation because I think it's really imperative and important. Today, as you may know, is the 51st anniversary of Martin Luther King's peaceful march in Detroit, the Great Freedom Rally, and where, um, and I that has had such an impact on our state, and of course, Martin Luther King on our entire country. And hearing that speech again um, this week, um, it makes us think about our college and what's going on in the area around us. So as a college, we're saddened and I personally am saddened and angered by the wrongful deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Armand Arbery, 
and the many more victims of racial injustice. As a college, we condemn these senseless acts of violence and join all those who demand justice. Racism is a powerful and insidious force in America that has created deep divides among people. And at what WCC, we continue to believe that systemic change is necessary to end racism. We welcome our responsibility as educators to accelerate that change for our students, our staff, our faculty, and our college community. We are committed to do more to make WCC a better place for everyone to learn and to work as a collective family with a passion and a focus on student, employee, and community success through equity and inclusion awareness, training, policies, and practices. After the departure of Dean Clarence Jennings, programming still continued. And I want to thank Caleb Kaleeb Boswell for keeping our brother to brother group thriving. And I'd also like to thank VPI Hearns for continuing to meet with the diversity committee in Clarence's absence. As you may be aware, we posted and even interviewed candidates for the Dean of Student Access, Success, Equity and Inclusion. And from that, we realized that, and we knew we had a gem when we had Clarence, but from that, we realized that Dean Jennings possessed a unique skill set that isn't easily replicated. In the midst of reevaluating the scope of the Dean position to attract the, the most qualified candidates, COVID 19 happened. So we did have some candidates. They didn't meet what we were looking for. So we are reposting that position. But I've asked AVP Tucker, cause we need to move to action right now. I've asked AVP Tucker, in addition to his current responsibilities to work alongside of me as an interim chief diversity officer in a role to help us chart our path forward on diversity and inclusion initiatives across our college campus. In addition, we will soon post that position of student access, success, equity, and inclusion. I want our faculty, staff, and students to know and to feel like their voice is heard and valued in a very safe space. We are working to do so, Brandon and I are working on scheduling campus conversations for faculty, student, staff, and forum for students to hear these conversations, to hear their concerns, to just understand their issues, and to provide a response that would meet their needs. Um, beginning next week, we are hosting webinars on race and ethnic studies. And these, and this was a, actually a suggestion from students that they thought we should you know, offer it through our academic programming. Well, we kind of are, but what we decided to do is we are offering these free webinars um, uh, to our community. They'll be free and open. There's five of them scheduled. And we do have a uh, part-time faculty member who will be offering these sessions. And Brandon and uh, Michelle Mueller are working on scheduling these seminars. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic showed us a lot. It laid bare what too many students, faculty, and students in color of color have always known. And you know what? Many of us have always known this too, that this country still has not delivered equality, justice, 
or opportunity for all. As a college, we are committed to redouble our efforts and to end discrimination and injustice and to eradicate bias, prejudice, and privilege as we do our part to eliminate the barriers to an affordable education for all. We do this work because we believe that all, all, we believe that not only are we individually and together responsible, but we are better off when we can learn, grow, and achieve but because we also collectively as a nation are better off when every person can access a quality education that opens the doors to an American dream. And we're doing things right now to take a look at that dig digital, the digital divide. I, it, it's just so incumbent upon us and we are looking at ways to provide better access for our students in that area. Well, the two reasons we, well, one trustee requested this presentation tonight, but it was a good suggestion because I think it's very good for us to reinforce to our community and our, by our community, I mean our campus community as well as our community that we take these things seriously and demonstrate how we are doing the things that we do all along. And um, so when we talk about our campus safety department, we, I remember all the discussions we had. I have notes on all your concerns. Linda Blakey has those. And we act very responsibly to address those. And it's good for you to hear the progress that we've made and any suggestions you may have. But we also have a very prominent police academy where we are training the future police officers for this county and for this region, which is why Brandon Tucker is, is going to present about you know, what we do in the police academy to address issues. So the presentation today will begin with Brandon Tucker um, talking about our police academy, and then we'll um, Linda Blakey will discuss our campus uh, security. So you know um, we report to the board often about minority status in hiring. We reported to the board. Um, especially when Clarence was here. So I'm really looking forward to that job again of looking at those data. You know, it, what gets measured gets done. And so we looked at how are we working with the different groups, the diverse groups. And we're continuing to do that, but we have to pick that up again, um, you know, in a way that we can, but we haven't dropped it, but it just was better when we had someone overlooking it. So we're very, very serious. And I've learned a great deal from things that uh, Kim has shared with me, Brandon has shared with me, and some of the things that, you know, I really am not aware of. I am, a, you know, somewhat aware that I'm concerned to hear about the fears that our own staff have about coming to work, about the ride to work about what they experience every day, perhaps in their job, maybe things that we say even unintentionally, that's not the right thing to say, in any way that we can ensure that this is a good place for all of us to work. So that is a real critical piece that we need to do and learn more about our students, and it, at first, you know, you may, we may think that it's um, issues about, yeah, and it's important to hear how they feel that they're treated unfairly, but I can't even imagine 
what it would be like. I, I, yeah, I could, and I don't want to imagine because it upsets me to imagine it. I can't imagine what it'd be like to be the mother of a black child that goes out to work every day, drives down these streets and has the fear that they may be pulled over or may be treated unjustly. Or our employees that might have children in that capacity. So we all wanna learn, we wanna understand through these campus conversations and we wanna do something about it. So I thought this would be the best way for me to introduce our academies. Uh, Brandon, would you like to talk about our police academy? Yes, thank you, President Balaka, and good afternoon, Board of Trustees. It's my honor and pleasure to give you an update today of uh, our police academy. And my goal is to provide you kind of the um, soup to nuts for how students get into the academy to how they actually leave prepared, uh, ready to be positive contributors in our uh, local law enforcement agencies. And okay, so what you'll see here is um, our police academy is uh, authorized by MCOs, the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards. And MCOs uh, provides the administrative oversight and authority for not only uh, police academies, but for all uh, police agencies and law enforcement agencies in the state. MCOs is made up of a commission of 19 uh, individuals that represent law enforcement community and community as large uh, that sit in Lansing and really drive the uh, policies and procedures that we as an academy and agencies have to operate under. Students who enter the academy can come in one of two ways, either as a pre-service candidate in which they are paying their own tuition, they're eligible for financial aid, uh, and they eventually will seek employment, or in-service candidates in which an agency such as the Washington County Sheriff's Office or Ann Arbor Police Department will sponsor that candidate, thus paying them a wage and paying their full tuition. We have seen over the last few years under the great leadership of Joyce Van Meter and our team that we have had a large increase in in-service candidates. Uh, we used to have one or two. Um, now we have, uh, have record numbers of 10 or 11 out of an academy class of 25 to 30. So in, in, in some instances, almost half from the local agencies are saying, we want to invest uh, in Washington Community College's training efforts. Everyone in the police academy must meet what is minimum licensing standards. Uh, there's a Public Act 289 of 2016 that allows for agencies, uh, let's give an example of maybe Detroit Police Department or Ypsilanti Police Department, that they can waive in the educational requirement and hire someone directly. As you'll see in our next slide, um, in order to get into the academy from an educational standpoint, you have to have a minimum of an associate's degree upon completion of the academy. With the exception, as I just mentioned, agencies that can provide uh, an exception to that rule, and that does happen, um, not as often as one would think, but sometimes individuals from a military background, they may waive that educational requirement. But otherwise, you have to have an associate's degree. You have to be um, no younger than 18, a U.S. citizen. And then you must have uh, character fitness, thus meaning good moral character, which is determined by an extensive background check that happens um, through a number of things which you'll hear about today. There are some prohibited criminal offenses that um, sometimes we get the question of, if I've done X, can I still be eligible to be a, a, a law enforcement officer? As you'll see here on your screen, of course, felony uh, convictions, um, if they've ever you know, had some level of imprisonment for more than one year, um, if they've had a DUI or OVI, 
Um, and, and you see here, second offense. The, the, the IMCO standards does allow for redemption, but it does look at it has to be, of course, a long time ago. So if someone was 19, made a mistake, and they decided to be a cop at 30, as long as it's not a recent offense, specifically around you know a DUI, then they potentially might be eligible. But then, of course, drugs. We know that um, cops on the street oftentimes may be exposed to, to drugs, not so much marijuana anymore because we know the laws have changed. But if they've had, you know, drug issues, domestic violence, things of those natures, um, those are prohibited. And, and I want to mention that we are authorized by MCOs to have what we call a regional academy. MCOs determines at the end of the day whether or not a uh, candidate is eligible to enter. So we don't have that determination while we have input regarding character and what we may gain from interviews. Um, those <laughs> major issues all have to be cleared uh, by MCOs. In addition to, of course, them being able to pass um, you know, a physical ability test, um, there's a medical exam. Um, and there are reading and writing exams that they have to pass. And of course, there's fingerprints for the background check. That background check, once again, is not administered through us, but is administered, of course, uh, in, in conjunction with MCOs. As I mentioned, there are 20 regional or 20 police academies in the state, 12 are regional, including WCC, um, three are what we consider agency academies. Detroit uh, Police actually has their own academy, uh, Michigan State Police of course, runs their own academy and DNR, the Department of Natural Resources. But then there are five academies that are what we consider track programs. Those are part of an existing uh, um, bachelor's degree program. So there are state, Northwestern Michigan College. But in total, there are 20 academies. As I mentioned, MCOS provides oversight. We're required to submit an annual operating plan, which details down to the minute of what we will be doing throughout our academy, where we'll be conducting our activities. And because we are a regional academy, we have to gain letters of support from our local agencies, whether that be the sheriff, whether that be Ipsy um, or Pittsfield Township. But then there is a field representative, uh, Matt Logie, who is amazing um, law enforcement leader. He's our side rep and he oversees essentially Washtenaw and about six other academies. He's on site, performs audits during each session, and then leads a confidential closeout in which there's interviews that happen with both participants, staff, and instructors um, to get their feedback on not how only we can improve the academy, but if there's issues that arise. Um, essentially, an individual will enter the academy by saying, hey, I'm interested. Um, they then have to submit uh, a large amount of documentation um, and consent to a background. Once they've submitted that information, we then provide an initial interview, which we've changed our practice in the last four years, where it's now a panel interview made up of local chiefs. So they begin to get the experience of what it's like to go before the interview board. Um, if they do well with that interview process, um, they will be then passed at the next stage, which they have to go through their medical and, and, and uh, psychological evaluation. What you might be hearing in the media right now is there are certain agencies and there are certain states in which a psychological evaluation is not mandatory. Michigan is one of the most uh, restrictive states in the fact that they have MCOs. A lot of other states have no oversight, um, even the example of Ohio, as closely as it is to Michigan, its level of entry into their academy and their essentially law enforcement doesn't require a degree, doesn't require a psychological eval. But we do that, of course, here in Michigan. Should they pass all of that, then they get um, a finalized offer. I will tell you, and the question may come up today is, well, how many people are are ready for our next academy. Uh, our next academy starts July 20th, and we actually have record a record number, 42 
um, have are, are currently in queue for the process, which shows that even in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of what we see going on, there are still people who are saying, I want to be a contributor to the good and not the bad. Our curriculum, uh, MCOs, mandates 594 hours of instruction. Uh, each academy can provide more, and every one, all 20 of our academies do. Um, and those additional numbers are based upon what the local area determines as a need. And as you'll see in the next few slides, our local area has some specialized things that they've said, we want to focus on this. So we offer a total of 805 hours of instruction, uh, which amounts to an additional 211 hours. And they are fully, um, those additional hours are movable. So if we see a need like we're seeing right now, we pivot and we add some things to make sure that it's relevant to our local area. As you'll see on your screen, uh, the blue is essentially what MCOS requires. And there are uh, a number of areas, investigation, patrol procedures, police skills, traffic. And as you'll notice on mostly every area, we provide over and above what is required. That's mainly because our advisory board made up of all those local chiefs and the, and the sheriff have said in Washington County and this region, we want to focus on A, B, and C. And of course, you know, I know this is a, a difficult slide to see and we can of course provide this if you want it, but you'll see, I think on the next slide, uh, it breaks out those areas. And our 800 level courses, which are the additional courses beyond what MCOS requires, specific to our academy, we focus on things like cell phone technology, things like officer psychological wellness and officer self-care, knowing that the stress of the job oftentimes is what contributes to some of the issues. So we make sure that our, our recruits who eventually become law enforcement professionals know how to take care of themselves so that they are not uh, getting burnt out and then leading to making bad decisions. But then we also focus on, you know, things of like officer-involved shootings. Um, and one thing that we pride ourselves in recent years is that we've adapted a large increase to scenario-based training. So students are not just going in in lecture and then being asked to take a test and see if they retain the information. They do that, yes, but they're also having to role play that and use scenarios to reinforce what they learn in the classroom. It's important to note that our curriculum overlaps a lot of our areas of study. So for example, when we talk about bias, we interweave bias into a multitude of our areas. So bias in ethics and policing, bias in crimes against person, bias in fear and impartial policing, for example, to ensure that they're able to take those themes and those tenets across the curriculum. One of the issues that we're seeing in America right now is use of excessive force. And in the law enforcement arena, we uh, relate that to what's called subject control. We teach our recruits to use the minimum force necessary to effectively arrest an individual. And of course, we, as you'll see on your screen, we, at every piece of our curriculum and every scenario, all of our recruits are paired up with not just one, but multiple instructors to ensure that not only that they get it in their mind, but that they actually can apply it all the way down to their form and their function. There is a continuum, as you'll see uh, with MCOs, that looks at subject control. And of course, it is the least level all the way to the highest level. And we try to, of course, show how you elevate up each level in the most responsible way. Um, and this is not something that we're just drawing attention to today because of what's going on. It's something that over the last three or four years, as we have uh, retooled our academy, we begin focusing uh, more deeply on this. 
You'll notice here, this is another example of our subject control. That's our mat room at Morris Lawrence. Um, we consistently try to reinforce good behavior across every piece of our academy. We do use pepper spray um, and pepper spray and tasers are in the MCOs subject control curriculum, uh, but we do not teach taser training because that is generally reserved for local agencies uh, in which once you get to an agency, they teach you on the type of taser that they may have uh, in use. But as you'll notice, uh, we do have a pepper spray and there is a number of scenarios, minimum of three, that students have to go through in order to show competency. What most people don't realize is that when an officer discharges, whether uh, it be pepper spray or another type of chemical, they oftentimes get that in their own eyes. So what we show our recruits is how do you effectively still have contact with the subject when you are having to operate with a distress like pepper spray. Um, and this is actually one of the, the, uh, the funnest exercises for our recruits. They hate it, but they love it at the same time. We are closely monitoring uh, all of the things that are going on. And the great thing about our academy is that we have around 96 instructors that teach across the curriculum. Um, some may teach two hours here and four hours there, but they're made up of local law enforcement who are currently on the job doing the right thing. And so as we look at adapting some changes in our curriculum, um, they're real time. Some of us may have seen in the media, um, uh, President Trump has released an executive order around safe policing. And it has a number of elements, some that are very germane to our police academy, specifically mental health response. And we're already teaching that. Um, legislation and grant programs, which will probably um, release a number of dollars that we might be able to go after to not only develop our academy, but remember our public service training department is the regional training academy for most uh, all uh, agencies that are in the area. So whether it's U of M, whether it's Pittsfield, uh, whether it's Saline, or even our own public service training department, our public safety department, we provide that regional training. But then also we know that that executive order bans chokeholds. I will tell you that chokeholds uh, is not a technique that is taught in our academy, um, has not been and will not be. Uh, as we know that there's now a national ban, it's not a best practice, and we don't use it. Some things that are currently in place, we of course have to adhere to MCO standards, but we are actually working on our IDATLAS accreditation, International Association of Law Enforcement Standards and Training. Uh, well, we um, sometime probably in the next quarter, uh, will submit ourselves study to become the first police academy in the United States to achieve accreditation. And of course, that those standards are even more stringent than MCOs. And what we have found as an initial test, uh, we are meeting a lot of the standards that are out there. So uh, we'll be excited to be able to submit that self-study and have our on-site visit sometime by the end of the calendar year 2020. But we are constantly looking at our training. And one thing that we have come up with is that we're gonna have a panel discussion. Uh, we teach, how to not use excessive force. But what we never do is have a panel discussion with local law enforcement, as well as maybe some community members that can speak to their own experience and how it has been. So in addition to teaching it, we're gonna provide some discussion in this upcoming academy. We will continue with our scenario-based training to include subject control. Uh, while we do it in our mat room, as we showed you a couple slides ago, uh, we're going to infuse this to have scenarios in which use of excessive force is present and to be able to showcase what it is like to be in a situation like that and why we should not do it. 
We also have, uh, in partnership with the University of Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor Police, and the Sheriff's Department, have a Milo system, uh, which we've used for the last three years that has been on campus, and we will continue to use uh, even greater now, which is a effective escalation, de-escalation scenarios in which you can actually go in a room and it will show you what it is like to be in the parking structure with five people coming at you as an officer. But then we're also going to look to see if there's more that we need to do. As we have our advisory board meetings and, and we could hear from our local law enforcement agencies that are on the front line, what are the, the burning problems? And because we are a regional academy, we're able to respond to those and be able to train our officers the right way. Um, some might ask, do we use body cams? Um, in 2017, uh, we invested in GoPro cameras that are actually affixed to the recruit and they're versatile. They allow for us to be able to go back and show a recruit, look what you just did, whether it was a great job and keep it up or let's change your form and let's change your technique. We use those not only on one-on-one -on -one scenarios, but even around vehicle stops, um, how you can assure that what we call the mechanics of arrest are being followed, as well as subject control. And some might say, why, why WCC, right? Um, our, our, our mantra and our motto is that we care and strive for excellence, but that we focus on scenario-based training and ensure that our recruits make solid and wise decisions, not because we told them to, but because they have seen what best practices show that you should do. But then we have, you know, the most modern training equipment, whether it be, as you see on your screen, our inflatable wall system that literally can showcase a commercial building or a house in about three or four minutes of blowing it up. But then also our police vehicles that we continue to make sure that we have the latest and the greatest in terms of tools, whether it be our vehicles, the fingerprint, state-of-the-art fingerprint kit that you see, or even our range, which you know we've invested a significant amount of money to make it state-of-the-art. But then, as I mentioned before, our Milo system, uh, which we were lucky, this is a $250,000 system that we did not have to pay for based upon our partnership with Ann Arbor PD, the Sheriff's Office, and U of M. They located on our campus. We already trained their, their officers, but that we also have access to that for free. Then, of course, as you see scenarios, um, we believe in showing not just telling. And if we teach, they should be able to apply. Our point of pride is that we have been around since 1987. And um, since we started that academy, we have had 85% of our graduates obtain employment. So we have a very high employment rate. That does not take into account the other 15% are probably individuals that either obtained employment federally or out of state, which we're not able to track. And then last but not least is our talent, is our part-time faculty and our administrative staff. As you'll see, uh, we have a large variety. Majority of those instructors, about half, come from the county, but we have a number of other counties that come and they show and they teach. And what does that do? That ensures that we have diversity, not only a race, but not only in, in, in background or agency structure, because I'll tell you that someone teaching from Moreau, their agency is gonna look a lot different than Ann Arbor PD or potentially Farmington Hills. So we wanna ensure that we have diversity um, of experience. And um, with that, our motto, I'll leave you with this, is that we care and we strive for excellence. Uh, I'll tell you that having been around our academy, uh, we have some of the best and the brightest, not only recruits that come out ready day one, but also our faculty that teach. Um, and, you know, a number of our students come directly from our associate's degree in criminal justice program here at the college. 
So, you know, it's oftentimes a continuum where we get them, they come ready to be a cop, they go through the CJ program, and then they enter the academy, or those who come already with a degree and they're looking to get those skills. So uh, with that, uh, I will guess I'll open it up for any questions, or maybe I can answer those at the end, up to President Malaka and Chair Fleming. I thank you. Um, Madam any- Chair, if yeah. I could just interject one thing before we ask, answer any questions. Mm-hmm. So when I first came here, I met with uh, the chiefs and they were very, very disappointed in our program and very upset. And, um, and I listened to this for a couple of years. And when Brandon took it over, uh, I think about five years ago, was it five, Brandon? Yep. I, I gave him the job of making sure we made him, ha- you know, we figured this out because they were upset that they were sending, they had to go to Schoolcraft Community College or other colleges to train for police officers. And so Brandon has worked very closely with the police advisory board and has implemented this program. So Brandon, I would like to thank you for what you have done over the years. And I was part of the beginning, so I know where it was and I know where it is. So Brandon, thank you. I'm no, sorry. Thank you, Pres- thank, no, thank you, President Malak. And really, the, the, I, I wanna thank our team, Joyce Van Meter and, and, and Sherry and Tom. Um, and John, they 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 have really helped in. It's a community effort. I have something I have to something. say. Go ahead. Um, feedback issue. Okay, are we good? All right, hang on. Since the five years, um, this is for uh, AVP Tucker. Since the five years that you've taken over. Um, what sort of percentage rate were we at at that time to where we are here? You know, like were, were we fifty percent in graduation rate? Now we're eighty-five. You know, what was sort of a significant um, impact in that percentage of graduation rate have we had since you took over? We have um, always graduated individuals, Trustee Davis. The question becomes whether or not they became certified by MCOs and took the test. Um, I will tell you that in the five years or almost six now, uh, we are usually maybe one or two failures um, out of the entire class. And, and that could be a first time failure. And then they go back in a week or two and retest. Um, I will tell you that when I started, it probably was more upwards of five or six. And uh, what we have done is we've really looked at our test bait questions and how we prepare those individuals for the test. And, you know, we do a lot of uh, outside of the classroom coaching and review to ensure that those individuals are ready for that, that final test through MCOs. Because while they may graduate and complete the academy, there is a, a certification licensure exam that MCOs administers in which they have to pass in order to be eligible to actually have a career in law enforcement. Now, do they have to continually be uh, recertified, if you will, like nurses would and other professions? Is this something that, that they do yearly or every other year? There, there is continual learning that happens, yes, uh, annually. And I mean, that could be everything from um, certifying with firearms qualification uh, all the way down to, you know, legal updates and law updates. Uh, you know, the good thing about it is that one thing that we do is our police and our corrections academy. But the other thing that we do is our in-service training. So we provide a large amount uh, of the in-service training that those officers within our region actually take part in annually. That's either online uh, through, we have an online firearms uh, class or, you know, know, on ground. 
And not only do we do that for all of those, those agencies, we also, our, our own police uh, department takes a part in that. And I think it should be noted that we have some very qualified, um, you know, uh, school resource officers that actually teach within our academy, within uh, our in-service, as well as attend those classes. So uh, we're very lucky with the quality of SOLs we have even on our campus. That's good. And I got one more, if that's okay, um, yep. Chair. Um, females, are there um, any uh, more females uh, as candidates or are they actively being recruited? I mean, what, what sort of the gender dynamics is that with the uh, police academy? Um, so we have increased the number of females, and I think that's largely a part to Joyce's leadership. Um, as well as the diverse pool of students has also increased. And I think that's largely about to us really partner with agencies. Uh, and it's, it's a struggle. Agencies will tell you, they've said it for years. It continues to be an issue today of having diverse, not only in gender, but also in race. Uh, but we, we have had over the last couple of years, some of the most diverse um academies that we've seen in years. I think there's a large part to our staff, to our faculty that are teaching, that are also encouraging people um, to come. Um, I did want to follow up. Um, I, I did just get a little message. Our job placement rate in the last five years uh, has increased by 20% to your question. And um, the completion of academy has increased by 10%. So we have uh, we have been moving the needle on both completion as well as job placement. Great, thank you. That's all. Yep. Any other uh, questions from the trustees on the police academy? I have some questions. Go ahead, Dave. Um, so, Vice President Tucker, can I get a copy of this? Because as I was looking at the slides. I was writing down some notes that are going to be questions, and I'll, I'd like to just submit some written questions to you that I could get some responses to. But if I could get a copy of the PowerPoint, that would be great. Um, going into the uh, breakdown on the gender and racial makeup of the classes, I'm wondering if you said we have 40 people incoming to the Fall Academy? There's 42 in Q. Uh, that number could change, you know. Could you get us a breakdown by gender and by race uh, of this upcoming fall academy, just as a uh, momentary snapshot. Mm -hmm. um, we offer, what, 820 hours of instruction now to complete the academy. Are they required to take all those 820 hours? They are. It is a requirement that they complete the entire, uh, the entire number of hours, yes. And uh, how how many weeks does that usually take for that completion? Eighteen weeks. It's eighteen weeks, and we are um, the, the the range. And I, I failed to mention this. I apologize. The range um, is anywhere from fifteen to sixteen weeks up to twenty two weeks. So each academy, as I mentioned, adds hours in based upon their regional need. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, when we first started, we were at twenty one. And people were not coming to us because we were one of the longest academy. And what we've done is really work in the last three and a half years with our advisory board to get us to a number that still has what our agencies are saying that needs to be taught, but it's not as long. And that, so 18 is, is probably the lowest that we would ever go at this point. Um, in addition to the PowerPoint on this, could I get a... Uh, Entire list of the entire curriculum, like what the classes are exactly. Yep. So, so inside of this PowerPoint, Trustee Devardi, um, and it was it was small, but on, on the one PowerPoint was, you'll be able to yeah, see it. It went yeah. by quickly. I was starting to take notes, and it was gone. Yeah, we can get you that. Um, the our instructors are they full time or part time? Our instructors are part time. They're all part time. And are they? Uh, with, with, do are with, with, do they all come from law enforcement backgrounds? I actually, I'd like to get the background or training 
of our, not by name necessarily, um, of all of our instructors. So uh, here are our instructors. I, what I'm looking for are instructors that have backgrounds in um, dealing with mental health uh, issues or dealing with uh, specifically with strategies for de-escalation, maybe from a social work perspective as opposed to a policing perspective. And I'm wondering if I'd, I'd just like to see what we have in terms of our instructors to see what kind of backgrounds our instructors are bringing to the training programs. So it, 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 if, if I may, would it be helpful? You're talking about in those specialized areas? No. So there's, 90, there, there's 96, roughly, give or take, right. part-time instructors. Okay. But, but some of those are teaching um, – um, you know, EVO, emergency vehicle operations, how to stop the car. Right. And those might be teaching two or four hours. And those are, are you know, um, what we call, you know, more training versus actual classroom instruction. Right. So I got classroom, you know, those, those kind of de-escalation, mental health, officer, um, you know, well-being, self-care. Those are more specialized. And we probably can get you a list of those. Um, I mean, if we, if we have 96 instructors, can't we just say, you know, this person, this instructor has, uh, 20 years of law enforcement experience. That's his background. That's what the expertise they bring. This person has, uh, training, uh, in mental health field and, and policing, or, you know, like in, it would be nice to just get, I mean, we have resumes on all of them. We could black out the names. And I could see what backgrounds they have without attaching names. To, I don't want to get at personnel records where I'm looking at what people don't need that. I, I want to see what training we have, what what backgrounds our trainers have. So I would like so to make a suggestion. Make this is Trustee McKnight Morton, and and I hear what Trustee I mean. I could put all this training requests. You might be but, no. What I would like to say is, um, if it's possible that um, that if anyone else is interested in any of this information other than this, uh, what we just heard, this uh, presentation, then they need to say that. Um, for one person, we've gone through this before, for one person to request something like that just for them, it really eliminates the rest of the board because we're all listening to the same thing. Now, as what you're asking, I think um, that's something that should be directed to the president, not to the vice president. Even though he's in charge of the program, I think that it should be directed to the president if this is a possibility, not Fine. that you want it. That's Fine. what I'm saying. Directed to the president. Yes. Okay. Um, if I may, um, President Blanca, could we just get like a really super general thumbnail on like half of them have this experience, 25% of them have this experience, like just keep it really super general. I won't get at it. That this is I'll put a, a written request to President Blanca. Okay. Um, I, think you know, this, I think this is probably I, pretty easy to see. And yeah. I, I view what I'm, I view my interest in this as a, as coming from a policy perspective, not, I'm not trying to get down in the weeds and do, and say, and micromanage, but I want to broad look to look at it as a broad policy perspective to see how much of our training is strictly coming from uh, long-term law enforcement and how much is coming from other areas of expertise. And I, it's totally relevant as a policy matter for, for this to be looked at. And I'll direct yes. questions to the president. Um, it, it, I need to, respectfully, I'd like to do whatever the board wants. I'm not sure how big this is. is. Okay. Or how about... You know, I, I do whatever. I mean, if that's, I'm, I don't get, maybe when you talk to me, David, I'll have a better understanding. Because yeah. it seems Blanca, like a lot to go through 90 people and write down all the training they have. And um, and I think that's to give you a comfort level, which I respect. Um, but 
I don't see how that relates to policy. But I think that gives you a comfort level. And I respect that you need that comfort level. Um, Jim, I mean, if, if the board trustees- I, I, I just want to say, I found uh, time and time again that you've been very responsive to my, my inquiries. Um, I highly respect your uh, responsiveness and uh, you know what we can just talk and Let's talk. Work out what what work out what the appropriate level of information is and i i respect your judgment thank on that you. yeah let's talk about it thank you okay I thank appreciate you. that okay any other trustees have a question i saw Ruth's box light up yeah my uh, um i'm i no longer connected to the meeting visually but i'm on the phone um I think it's very important for us to know the background of those instructors um, uh, because we're responsible as trustees for um, supervise or for uh, uh, offering this training to police. And it seems that in the current environment, the training of police is very, very important. Um, and if they're trained uh, by the good old boys who've been there forever, um, that's a different thing than if they have some training with uh, social workers or mental health workers or um, uh, more modern policing methods. And I, I know that David um, and neither David nor I are trying to impugn the program with this, but we have a responsibility to know that we are training police in a progressive, humanistic way. And the only way we can do that, or at least one way we can do that, is to look at the qualification of the instructors. And I think it's very important. OK, thank you, Ruth. Um, President Blanca, I'm going to trust you on this one. You know, no, I don't, you know, I don't on all of them. Okay. I, <laughs> I don't want to, you know, invade anybody's privacy. I don't want to, yeah, um, right. you know, cross any line that shouldn't be crossed, mm -hmm. but there may be just a general community interest in just kind of knowing what the background is. I don't I understand. We'll yeah. figure, I'll figure something out with Dave. Okay, thank you. We well I, I, don't okay. I don't want it to be hard. I don't want it to be hard at all. No, though. I understand. Okay. We'll figure something out. Madam Chair. Yes, um, ma'am. Good night, Morton. And um, what I said to Trustee Duvardi is not that I don't want to know. I think we all need to know. That's all I'm saying. But what I right. am saying is this. I think when, when a question is asked of an individual who is doing a presentation, if there's certain things that, that you would like, present it in a way so that the board is involved in this, not just one individual. That's all I'm saying. And, and this type of instance or other instances that it needs to be presented to the president because she is uh, over these programs and she's the one can help with this information versus the vice presidents. I hope I made myself clear. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions on the police academy topic? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Ruth's lighting up. Ruth lit up. Oh, Ruth, did you have another question? No, I don't know why I lit up. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Just making sure. Thank you. Um, okay. We're going to go on to the public safety update. VP Blakey, are you ready? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm going to provide an update on our public safety department. Do I have control? Yes, thank you. So the mission of our the Department of Public Safety is to create a safe, welcoming, and inclusive community. We will ensure the protection of each person's constitutional rights and that all people are treated with equality, respect, and compassion that they, and they focus on, so that they may focus on their educational development. The department and all employees are also committed to supporting the overarching institutional mission of the college. So the values of our public safety department are based on pride, professionalism, respect, integrity, dedication, and excellence. So the vision and philosophy, um, if you remember, we had you know, many years of conversations about whether to have um, a police department of our own, but we want to provide safety and service to our campus community 
Um, our partnerships will foster trust, mutual respect, and cooperation with all members of the community. And most important, we're going to be integrated into the culture of the college and a resource for everyone. So I think that culture of the college, and that was one of the main reasons we decided to have our own department is so that we would have our own officers. So the importance of our own officers on campus, we control the hiring and the training of our officers. They're integrated, as I indicated, into our campus culture. And it allows whenever possible for, if there's criminal activity, for us to handle it through the student conduct process rather than the criminal court process, which we're able to do because it's our own officers. So for community policing, our officers are visible and they're integrated on our campus. They know our faculty, our staff, and our students. They're approachable and they provide support. We chose officers with years of experience in community policing. It was very important for us. We went through a lot of applicants to find those that were a good fit. Um, and we focus on support rather than enforcement. So here's some ideas, here's some indication of our officers at Welcome Day, which they always participate in. There are staffing. We have um, Scott Hilden, who's our chief. We have Matthew Lodge, who's our deputy chief, and our campus resource officers. And you all met these at uh, a prior meeting, Cameron Bauer, John Elkins, Paul Gomez, and Jeffrey Shoemaker. Our public safety department is also, we have non-sworn. We have full and part-time public safety patrollers that are non-sworn. We have full and part-time dispatchers because we're open 365 days a year, 24 seven. And we also have a full-time security and fire alarm person that's in public safety for all of the door access and safety alarms. So for our sworn officer hiring, um, the five officers that were hired once we decided to have our own um, police department, um, we went through extensive interviews and background checks. There was psychological testing done prior to hire. Our officers have over 120 years of community policing experience and 40% of our officers that were hired are minority. There's another indication of our officers um, participating in Welcome Day on campus. There's a presence at our a community event. So our training is proactive, it's not reactive. Um, all our officers came with years of training, but we've done, as soon as we set up the force, we had training in anti-bias and implicit bias. And as Brandon noted, they took training, they did training through our police academy, through our in-service sessions, but they've also attended just our regular campus in-service training as well. They've done diversity and inclusion, de de-escalation techniques, including verbal judo, mental health training, our ethics, emotionally dealing with emotionally disturbed individuals, excited delirium, community policing. And again, our officers bring years of training and years of experience in community policing. Less lethal force training, um, use of pepper spray and taser, and we've also been able to access the Milo training system for scenario training, as Brandon noted. So the activities we've done on campus since we've established the force, we have the CLEMIS system, which is the court and law enforcement management system, which is used throughout Southeastern um, Michigan. The 800 megahertz radios that we talked about because of the Washtenaw County public safety millage, we were able to get those radios for our officers. We provide, our officers provide active, Alice active shooter response training that's provided to staff, faculty and staff during our in-service sessions. We've also done safe, general safety sessions for our students. Um, that included Alice, but we also did um, awareness of edibles. Um, when the marijuana laws changed in Michigan, we certainly saw an uptick of students bringing edibles to campus. And so making students aware of being careful what to eat once that law changed. Um, we've also had active um, online active shooter and classroom lockdown training required for our employees. And we've worked with our student development and activities to um, launch coffee with the cop sessions. So those are noted here. So other activities we have, we've launched this last year, we launched a uh, app called WCC Safe. Uh, it provides safety information and alerts. It also allows faculty and staff to contact public safety via text messages. 
especially if there was an emergency in a classroom, people may not feel comfortable using their phone or picking up the, the classroom phone, but they can text if there's an emergency occurring. We've also implemented a distributed antenna system that you approved earlier to amplify the strength of those radios since those radios are used by first responders across the state. We've also moved to establish a community emergency response team on our campus. Um, CERT is volunteers. We have uh, 25 WCC staff who volunteered to be part of our CERT team. Uh, it required over 21 hours of training. It educates volunteers about disaster preparedness and hazards that may occur in our area. Um, the training included disaster response skills, fire safety, light search and rescue, team organization, and disaster medical operations. So we're very proud that we now have an established CERT team on our campus. There it talks about the special training that they um, had, and they also attend two-hour sessions quarterly. We've also had activities with our community county par partners. Um, we hosted earlier this year an active threat tabletop exercise that included eight local law enforcement partners, including the FBI and the state police. We also had St. Joe's Hospital and Huron Valley Ambulance as part of that um, tabletop. We've purchased um, and, and trained our staff on emergency, using emergency medical tourniquets and quick clot products. So again, if we needed to do a response to a mass casualty event, and we also have had our staff participate in countywide active threat trainings. We have our staff participate in countywide detective bureau meetings. Um, Chief Hilden has been chosen as the vice chairperson at the Washtenaw County Criminal Justice Association. And our campus resource officers participated in the annual Shop with a Hero event for a local family to provide gifts for the holidays. Cameron Bauer and that event. I think it's really important to note that um, our officers um, are a core part of our WCC care team. Our care team um, adheres to core values of integrity, community, social justice, respect, and responsibility. We deeply care about the health, well being, safety, and success of our students and employees. And um, that's why we uh, created the WCC care team, which is our behavioral intervention team. We're designed to intervene early and provide support to our students who may be displaying emotional or distressed behaviors. Our team utilizes a proactive and multidisciplinary approach in support of the safety, health, and well being of all of our campus. We're comprised of licensed professional counselors, our three public safety officers, and student services administrators. I think it's important to note that we, our officers provide wellness checks. So if we have students who have indicated harm to self, and if we're not able to determine the status of those students, our officers provide wellness checks and coordinate those wellness checks when needed on lo with law lo local law enforcement agencies. Linda? Yes? Could you explain what a wellness check is? Yes. So a wellness check, we may get a report from, you know, we have our uh, report of concern. We also introduced a care form this year. And so faculty may um, indicate that uh, a student submitted either an assignment with some concerning remarks or an email that they're corresponding, or they may just have, um, you know, the student has made some um, concerning remarks. And so we will do outreach to those students. Um, if we have an indication that they may be um, indicating they may be harming themselves or want to harm themselves, if we can't good, get a good response from them, then we do a wellness check. And so an officer goes to the student's home and determines that they are safe. Um, we've also sometimes had to go to a, um, an individual's home and some, in some cases transport them to the hospital because they were indicating they were going to harm themselves and we get them to a hospital so that they can be um, taken care of. So for accreditation, um, their ICLEA is the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators. Um, and we are in the process of um, going through the accreditation process for our agency. Um, and if we are able to get accreditation, which I am totally confident because that we will, 
will be the first higher education institution in Michigan to have an accredited law enforcement agency. I also want to note that, you know, during the entire pandemic, um, our officers and public safety staff have been on campus 24-7. Um, and so, and as we've expanded our health screening, those are the individuals that are taking care of that. I would like to acknowledge um, their work during the crisis. Thank you. Is there any Thank questions? you, Linda. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, do any trustees have questions on our public safety program? Uh, yes, uh, McKnight Morton here. Go ahead, Diana. Uh, I uh, say that uh, congratulations to Linda and her team in uh, acquiring the accreditation. And, and I think we, that, we haven't got it yet. We're working. You know, but, but you know what? It sounds good to me. So I'm going to say it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and one more thing. Yeah. Okay. I know when I talk, I lean forward. I, I I push my my iPad back, and I still lean forward. So if I lean forward, just I just lean forward. I'm sorry. I apologize. So I, my daughter has already told me umpteen thousand times not to lean forward, and I still do. So go ahead and laugh, because I'm laughing, and, and Angela is laughing too. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. You lean all you want, Diana. <laughs> do any other questions? I do just have one quick question. Um, okay, go, ahead. go ahead. Um, yeah, it's awesome that we can. Wait, hold on, hold on. Hello? Okay, no feedback. Um, this is to. Uh, uh, VP Blakey, it's awesome to hear about the accreditation. Um, now, how soon will we hear? Is it still a little bit more that we need to go through to get the final T's crossed and the I's dotted to actually be confirmed? Yes. So there will be a process. Um, you know, there's, you know, like 700 processes we have to have in place. We've already started working on that. But once you apply, you will have to actually have a campus visit by an accreditation um, to get that process. So I expect it'll be, you know, a year to 18 months because it's not something you can instantly <clears throat> apply. There's a bunch of, a lot of documentation that we'll submit to the agency, but we are well on our way to having it completed. Awesome. Great. That's wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Any other trustees have questions on public safety here? This is Ruth Patrick. Can you hear me? Ruth and then Dave, okay? Go ahead, Ruth. Yeah, um, since I can't see um, the, the presentation and the PowerPoint, um, could I have uh, maybe via email or fail mail um, the, the, the um, PowerPoint presentation on the, the training for our police and what training they've been through? Um, of course, I can't. I can't see it, so I'd like to have a copy of it somehow, Linda. Okay. And, and okay. also, Linda, thanks for returning my call last week. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Dave. Um, simple question. I first of all, I'm happy that the our public mm -hmm. safety officers are getting uh, like first responder training and applying tourniquets and the like. Are they carrying Narcan um, in, in case they, at this yes. point, I'm assuming they are at this point? Yes, they are, okay. yes. And then as part of the training, it wasn't called out separately. Do they have some sort of background training in how to deal with uh, issues that arise out of substance abuse situations? Yes. Or is that not dealt with? Yes. Okay, that's, good. that's adequate. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other trustees have a question? Okay, thank you. These were a really great set of reports. Um, we're going to go on to tab B, the personnel recommendations. Okay, where am I? Um, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the monthly personnel recommendations as listed. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Davis, uh, support. 
Okay, thank you. Any discussion on the personnel recommendations? Um, it's Ruth Hatcher. Um, mm -hmm. I just noted that there are um, 25 uh, reduction in personnel. Is this a result of the um, uh, uh, reduction in force that we talked about last last month? These people um, have a variety of between two and and uh, thirty years experience. I'll, I'll speak to that. This, this is a uh, combination of resignation, a uh, retirement, and position elimination. Not all from the reduction of force that we had talked about. It also involves a um, grant elimination. Um, so uh, there are a couple, um, several employees actually um, whose position was eliminated due to that grant elimination as well. Okay. Thank. Thank you. And and. Um, when these people are leaving the college, do we thank them or help them uh, with their next steps, that kind of thing? Because I, I'm not sure we've seen 25 before um, leaving. Um, we've done a variety. Um, uh, we obviously have uh, an exit uh, process that we go through. Um, in some cases, there is additional assistance provided um, uh, with career transition as well. Great, thank you. And thank you for the org charts. I appreciate that. Um, McKnight Morton here. Um, I just would like to, um, con well, say, kind of, I guess, congratulate the ones who are retiring. I didn't write their names down, but um, with 15, 20, 33 years and more, um, I think that they have served the, our institution very well and has stayed with us for a long time. And I just want to say kudos to them in their retirement or whatever it is, but the ones who are, are, have been with us the longest, um, I want to say thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Any other trustees have comments on the personnel? Okay, hearing none, uh, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you, everybody. Going to tab C. <clears throat> Tab C, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees extend the appointment of Dr. Rose B. Belanca as President and Chief Executive Officer to June 30th, 2023, and that the Chair of the Board of Trustees be authorized to sign a contract with Dr. Belanca on behalf of the Board. Do I hear a motion? Milliken so moves. A second? Devardi yeah. seconds. Okay, any discussion on tab C? Okay, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. <laughs> Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. yes. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Next is tab D. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve a 1.5 adjustment to the independent staff salary and, and wage rates for the 2020-21 fiscal year. Do I hear a motion? Devardi moves. Devardi seconds. Okay, thank you. Any discussion on the salary adjustment? I have a question. Go ahead. This is tab D, right? Yes, tab D. That's the uh, support staff workers? Yeah. Um, no. 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 It, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. These are independents. Okay, fine. Then my question is on the next one. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions on this, tab D? Okay. Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milligan? Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. 
Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Uh, looking at tab E now, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-21 part-time support staff and club sports coaches wage rates as submitted. Uh, do I hear a motion? Davis, so move. Move. Oh. Okay, I heard That's Davis and then Hatcher, are you seconding? Second, second. That's okay, fine. thank you. Any discussion on tab E? I have a question. Go ahead, Dave. Um, are we, I'm not, not so much the salary, are we actually having club sports going with coaches with the pandemic? Is these are like contact activities. I don't know. So, uh, sorry, this is uh, you, EVP Blakey. Um, if we will, um, we, we may not be able to, um, based, we may be able to do some of these in winter, um, but we still put these in place just in case we're able to have any sports. Okay, thank you, guys. Sorry, just because you're approving this doesn't mean that they're necessarily, they'll only get paid if we're actually going to run a team sport. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. Secretary Devardi? Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Is she still with us? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. She's muted. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee Wingbank Morton? Ignite Morton, yes. Thank you. Looking at tab F now, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-21 part-time faculty wage rates as submitted. Do I hear a motion? So move. Okay, second. Second. Okay, thank you. Any discussion on tab F? Okay. Hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milligan? Milligan, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. Secretary Devardi? Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Looking at tab G now, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020 21 faculty department chair appointments as submitted. Do I hear a motion? So moved, Patrick. Second? You've already second. Thank you. Any discussion on tab G? <laughs> Is Hector, can you hear me? Yes, Ruth. Um, are, are there any new chairs or are these mo oh, mainly chair. continuing chairs? Uh, Trustee Hatcher, there actually are, there are some new chairs and some transitions, um, okay. but there, there, there are some that are staying on that have been um, more of our senior chairs that, that'll be there to mentor others. That's right. And were there any um, controversies about elected chairs that were not acceptable to the administration? Nope, not at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions on tab G? Okay, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milligan? Milligan, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. yes. Secretary Devardi? Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Uh, looking at tab H now, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees receive the financial reports for May 2020 as follows. General fund, deferred maintenance fund, capital fund, and combined schedule of investments, all funds. Uh, do I hear a motion? Hatcher, so moved. Okay, second. Devardi, second. Okay. Um, VP Johnson, would you like to add anything here for us? Yes, please. Thanks, Chair Fleming. Go ahead. Um, if we could go to page two, please, in the do document. Uh, next page in. There it is. 
Um, so just a, a couple of key key trends that I wanted to point out for the board. Uh, once again, uh, revenue was running in many areas below low budget, uh, specifically tuition uh, and fee revenue, uh, and that's and that was anticipated. Uh, and then property taxes is running slightly above budget, and we anticipate that that trend to continue, uh, along with state appropriations. Uh, and state appropriations really is 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 two pieces. One is the makeup money for local community uh, uh, state state stabilization. The makeup for personal property tax is a little bit better than budget, uh, along with uh, the funding for the uh, higher pension plan costs, which we didn't anticipate at the levels uh, that we had originally bu uh, uh, budgeted is helping. I point out for the board uh, in the narrative that. Uh, that we still fully anticipate uh, a strong possibility that we will not receive the full base state aid budget amount. Of course, the state is still trying to resolve their budget issues, both for the current fiscal year and, and for next year. So we, we think there's a strong likelihood that state appropriations line um, could go negative by year end. And, uh, and our revised budget for this year and all the costs containment measures we put in place were to help to uh, to offset those anticipated impacts. On, on the cost side, speaking of cost containment measures, so you'll see on total expenditures that were actually below budget about 2.6 million. Um, that was uh, fully anticipated. Um, you know, when the college went into remote operations, we uh, strongly slow down the uh, the spending for direct expenditures or non personnel expenditures, uh, uh, along with the uh, the im the impact of reduction of hours uh, for uh, part time staff after we had completed our winter semester. Uh, so we, so we're about 2.6 million um, to the good on expenditures, and that's an important set of resources that will help to offset the anticipated revenue reductions that we're going to receive most likely from both the state aid cuts uh, along, along with um, the uh, spring revenue enrollment, which is about on plan, but uh, one of the ways that we got there was through um, uh, pro providing very generous payment plans uh, for our students, and we're seeing a rising level of accounts receivable for some of our students that we think will be a write-offs in, in the end. The other thing I'll point out for the board, if we could go to page four, uh, a couple pages back, please. Uh, the deferred maintenance schedule. Um, we've taken the opportunity, Craig Whipstock and the um, facilities team has taken the opportunity since we've put in certain projects that were related uh, not to safety and reliability, but to upgrades. We've put those uh, on the pause button and we reallocated the funds to things that, that, that were critical for safety and reliability. Uh, and so you will see some new, some, some new projects uh, on, on this list that relate to elevators uh, and relate to uh, the dredging of our ML, our, of our ML retention pond which are, are, are critical things that we need to provide some funding for, especially in light of the fact that we're proposing in next year's budget a lower level of deferred maintenance. But you will see that we have a, uh, we a fully utilized and balanced deferred maintenance fund. And uh, that's my highlights. Okay, thank you. Any questions for v VP Johnson? I, I have a question. Go ahead, Dave. Um, is there... Uh, federal CARES Act money uh, in, for relation to the pandemic that's reflected in some of these line items, or are we anticipating anything this fiscal year? We are, um, Trustee uh, Trustee Devardi, we are, but it's uh, it is not yet not yet reflected. Those are restricted funds. So what will happen is there are certain expenditures that are starting to be reflected uh, in our actuals for this year that we actually will move into the restricted fund once we get clarity from the Department of Education that they're eligible for reimbursement. And will that show in our this fiscal year, do you anticipate, or in next fiscal year? 
I think uh, it really depends uh, on whether or not that the DOE um, provides that guidance. They, they, they know they need to provide additional guidance. Uh, and so I, I believe it could be one of these year end accruals that we book late in August prior to, find, to finalizing the fiscal 20 results. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Has Go ahead, Russ. Um, in your narrative on page one, you mention online and virtual classrooms, and um, I did. did what is the, what's the definition and difference between online and virtual? Sure. So for uh, for on, online, that is the um, that is the traditional um, synchronous course uh, that that we offer. Uh, that uh, you know, students can study at their own pace with no assigned times. The virtual was the new, the new form of, of distance learning classroom uh, that is tied to some, some assigned times of class participation and then some self-study. Okay, and we are currently doing both? Yes, we we uh, we all for that in in a limited for, uh, fashion for uh, spring summer, and there are more offerings of that being um, put on the schedule for this coming fall. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for VP Johnson? <clears throat> I'm sorry. That's okay. All right. Hearing none. Uh, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milligan? Milligan, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. We are now on tab I, the facilities development report. Uh, VP Johnson, would you like to give us any highlights here? Just a couple. Um, okay. Uh, actually, item one, uh, we, are, we are pleased to announce that the Energy Center cooling tower replacement that we were able to get the firm in from Oklahoma uh, and uh, get all our issues resolved uh, and the campus uh, is being cooled as we speak, which has you know, <laughs> been, uh, been appreciated as I've been on campus, we're, we're working on reopening plans, so uh, that's up, up and running. Um, you will note uh, that we are uh, hard at work while the fitness center is in shutdown mode. We are trying to get some critical projects going. Uh, two that are key um, is uh, items eight and nine, the pool, the pool resurfacing, um, that, we, uh, that the contractors actually started that, that work. It takes time to drain the pool that's been drained and they're starting their work there. And the hot tub, um, they have started the, de the uh, demolition of the men's hot tub as well. Uh, so that's ongoing. Uh, we've also taken the opportunity to do other work uh, that is difficult uh, to do during uh, when the, camp the campus is open. So a lot of, con of con concrete repair. Uh, in lot six, we had a, a, uh, a lighting uh, issue, so we needed to, uh, to uh, rewire certain lighting fixtures in the park, the park parking lot, so we've done that, that work. Um, Craig Whipsock and his work have also done a great job of taking this opportunity to continue to pursue energy conservation projects. So we've done a lot of lighting replacement um, throughout, uh, throughout the, uh, the uh, buildings as well. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention uh, is uh, under the bottom of page two, item one, the SEMCOG pathway. Um, if you happen to drive by campus, you will see that the pathway is done. Um, it is beautiful. Uh, and we're currently working on some, uh, land, some landscape restoration uh, for, that, uh, for that project. So that, is, uh, that, that was a wonderful outcome. Thanks. Any questions on facilities development? Yes. Uh, yes, this is McKnight Morton. Um, well, the first thing I wanna say uh, congratulations in getting the uh, non-motorized pathway completed. That, I'm really pleased with that. Thank you so much. Um, but my other uh, question or question is uh, item 20, the IR roof survey, and it says June start. What is that? 
So that is, uh, so one of the things that Craig Whips Whipstock brought was um, a lot of specialties around on understanding uh, the current conditioning of our building systems, one of them being roofs. So we've had a lot of diff difficulties with uh, minor and sometimes more major roof leaks across campus. So Craig ordered that we do a in and in uh, in infrared. That that's it. I had to think of the word infrared a roof sur survey. So we're actually doing an X-ray, a kind of a heat map uh, of our of our roofs, uh, so that we can see where all of the, all the key leaks are. And so he is doing that 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 work as we speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, did somebody else have a question on facilities? Yes. Go ahead. VP Johnson, tell us again why an Oklahoma firm had a corner on our cooling tower work. They, uh, it's, uh, the name of the firm is Tech Towers, and the control system uh, that we used was a state-of-the-art con control system I mean, it's been in existence for a number of years, but this particular firm really is uh, one of the leaders. Uh, and so under the general contractor, which was Eckert, Eckert, Me Eckert Mechanical, so they had subcontracted out to Tech Towers as being the key lead firm for these control systems, which among other things are really strong in energy conservation. Uh, we, we went from two cooling towers to three cooling towers. It allows us to be able to do the maintenance we need to do and also run all two or three cooling towers at lower capacity and save a lot of energy. There's a lot of control systems that come with that energy conservation that Tech Tower was a specialist in. So we got world-class service. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on facilities? All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to the remarks of the Board of Trustees. Do any trustees want to make remarks? I do. So so this I hear, is Morton. Hang on, I hear uh, Ruth and I hear Diana. Uh, which one? Okay, we'll let Diana go first and then Ruth second, okay? Okay, thank you. Right. And I promise I won't get up in front. Um, <laughs> couple of things is on my mind is um, I mentioned earlier about the, the two deceased people that um, one that worked at the, at the college, Dennis Bila. I remember when I first started at the college in 1994, I met Dennis. At that time, we had to go around and meet everybody. Uh, and Dennis, throughout and I was on a negotiating team at that time because I had, through my experience at the county, I was uh, on the negotiating team. So I had uh, exp background experience with that. And Dennis, even in our uh, negotiations, was always very, very polite. He listened to everybody on both sides and he gave very good uh, responses and we would take that. He would always accept uh, any types of, uh, of uh, ideas that anyone would have or how we can come. And I never forget one of the things in that one of our negotiations, and this was at that time with Dr. Gundermeyer. He said, I want this to be a win-win situation. And it worked out. And we both, when we left out of this room together, all of us, it was, everyone was shaking hands. Everyone was a very, very cordial to each other. And, and, and it, it turned out to be a very good um, meetings that we had with him. I just want to give my condolences to the family and his friends, especially colleagues. Uh, and Ruth, you were part of a lot of Dennis Vila's uh, favorite people, I would like to say, maybe I shouldn't say that, but he liked you a lot. And, and I really appreciate his service to the college. And I'm very sad to hear of his passing. Now, Bill Davis, Bill Davis was on the board when I came. And um, he was very, very uh, knowledgeable about a lot of things because he was an entrepreneur. He and his wife, both Judith, Judith, 
and him had owned businesses for many years, and then he developed or got this company, and he was very knowledgeable about a lot of things in uh, entrepreneurship and how people uh, could, you know, make money from their own running their own business. <clears throat> He was very, um, very instrumental because in, uh, he and a few other board members, along with myself, um, went through the process of developing the Washington Community College Technical College. And it was difficult, but we went through it. And, and it, at that time, it was, it was dip, a lot of difficulty trying to get it together but also difficult because the neighboring school districts didn't understand the concept and did not want to participate. So our, our board worked together as a one board to make this happen. We worked hard on getting this technical college developed and up and running. So I just wanna give my condolences out to Judith Davis. Uh, she was a wonderful person. And I know she was a good wife and um, they contributed to the college and Bill was, went on to the, on to the um, WTMC um, direct, board of directors. And I just wanna say he, he really, um, he, he did a lot in his tenure as a board trustee. Now, my next thing, I just wanna, uh, I just wanna say that I'm, 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 I remember reading the packet, and one of the things is said that uh, was about student strategies. And I really had, I wasn't quite sure because I saw different scenarios about student strategy, and I hadn't heard that. Or, and so I'm not sure how that's going to work out. So I'd like to hear more about that. And um, my other thing is that I would like to hear more about. Um, how the um, how the college with the streamlining of the personnel will affect the operations of the college. So I would those are just two things I would like to hear, and I'm putting it out on board. I mean, out, out here for it to be um, discussed if it, if we get to that point. And another thing is uh, about the CARES Act and the 880 million um, from my meeting on. Friday uh, telephone call with the board of directors of the MCCA. Um, what we had found out, Mike Hansen and Aaron Shore had found out that as far as the 880 million that's supposed to be coming, they still the state still doesn't know how they're going to divide it up. Unless Bill Johnson has a, a little bit more insight than I do from what I heard on Friday, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. I want to add something about our NASA scholars. I think hang on, hang on, Emily Bill. Ruth, and... Hang on, Bill. I'm sorry, Ruth was second, and then you can be third. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, I have two thank yous uh, for HR. One for the org charts that I, you know, love, and also for um, their help for Sally Fila. Um, uh, she did not know much about the family finances, and I asked her how that could possibly be with, uh, she called me Tuesday morning, um, because Dennis was so careful, and she said maybe it had something to do with the fact that I didn't want to talk about it. So HR uh, was very responsive to her and helping her get things settled. Um, two brief stories, uh, and also thank you to the uh, to Rose's office for their kind words that they sent out to the community. Um, two brief stories about Dennis. Um, my first negotiation with Dennis, you can imagine I was very nervous and taking copious notes about what everybody said, and Dennis was writing as well. And in one of the breaks, I asked Dennis um, about his notes, and when I looked at his notes, they weren't notes. He was doing math problems. And that's how he listened, was by doing math problems. When Sally called me Tuesday morning to tell me that uh, Dennis had gone, um, one of the things he was very concerned about was to let the math department know that he would not be teaching in the fall. 
he taught every semester um, and was scheduled to teach um, in this fall, and that was one of his major concerns um, as he was dying at uh, um, U of M Hospital. Um, so yes, we were very close, and I want to thank uh, Rose's office and HR for their help to that family. Um, I'm also grateful uh, for the work that um, uh, Bill Johnson has done and others have done in the midst of all the um, decline in enrollment and finances that we're able to uh, provide for salary adjustments. They're modest, but in these times they are quite generous. And I congratulate the office for being able to do that for the employees that are here at the college. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, Bill, you go. Our NASA scholars that we heard about earlier, Emily and, and Maximilian, very exciting opportunity. Uh, when I was in Washington, D.C., I worked for NASA. Uh, that environment is very stimulating, and uh, they're going to walk in there with their eyes wide open, and when we see them again, they're going to infect everybody around them with the enthusiasm and the stimulation that they got at NASA. Happy for them. Thank you. It's exciting. Do other trustees have comments? I just have a quick one. Go ahead, Angela. All right, just one moment to make sure our feedback is down. All right. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Um, I was reading through, um, and I can, forgive me because I forgot the young man's name. I believe his name is Khalid. He's the one that received one of the um, scholarships for a full ride. And forgive me, I'm kind of running on a little bit of memory here, but he and I used to work together at TJ Maxx. And I'm really proud of him, and I wanted to give his name um, a lot of um, recognition because he does work hard. He's, he's very passionate in what he is um, wanting to accomplish in his career. And, um, and I wanted to say uh, he couldn't have gotten a better education anywhere else, and I'm happy that he chose WCC. And forgive me, I cannot remember his last name. Um, he, his first name was Khalid. So, um, just wanted to say, keep, keep your eyes out on him because he definitely has a, a shining star ahead of him in his, uh, his life. Definitely. Thank you. Are there any other board comments? Okay. I'd like to just say a couple of things because of, um, all that is happening in our world right now and all that we have to deal with as a campus. One, um, we are still in the middle of a global pandemic. And if there's anything I know for a fact, it is one, the sun rises in the east, that is a fact. And two, there is currently no vaccine for this virus. That is a fact. And it is that knowledge that guides me when I'm making choices and decisions or giving advice or recommendations to the president. I think it's important that we act on facts and what the public health officials and doctors know. And I applaud the administration for how quickly they locked down the campus how quickly they were able to retool our entire system for distance learning. And I just wanna say I'm very proud of all that this administration and teachers and, and staff has accomplished throughout this time. We still have a long way to go and we will get there. The second thing I would like to address is the um, civil unrest and social issues that we're dealing with. We heard two really great reports today, reports that just, I, I almost cried <laughs> um, listening to them. Um, very, very early on in, in my childhood, I can remember seeing um, police brutality and beatings. When I was 16, I saw the Rodney King 
um, assault on TV. It was replayed over and over so many times. And before Rodney King, there were many others. These things were very formative to me in my early adolescence. And I carry that with me when I make choices and decisions. Early on in my tenure here as a trustee, gosh, I think it was maybe five years ago now, right about the time when uh, Mr. Tucker was starting these initiatives to improve our diversity program. I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago, our diversity program was really just putting on cultural shows. When I think of how much, when I think of how far we have come to um, respond to diversity issues, especially on race, I I'm very proud to have stood here in support of this, of this school and this administration to make those changes. I believe in our community policing program. I stand by my choice to support it, and I believe in the work that Chief Hilden is doing. I believe in the expertise that he brought to our little micro community, and I still stand in support of it. It happens to be the new buzzword now, community policing, and we as a team and as a micro community already have done it, and we've been there, and we are at the cutting edge, and I am proud, so proud of everybody, just everybody. And that's what I would like to say about the two big issues facing us today. Do any other board members wish to make a comment? If not, we, I will move on to President Blanca. Are you ready? You're muted. You're muted, President Blanca. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Go ahead you. when you're First ready. First of all, I'd like to thank all the trustees for your comments. I really gave my comments in the beginning of the presentation today. Um, and um, I, I really, you know, I'm looking forward to the meetings that we're going to have to share uh, the pandemic and the different phases of, uh, of opening the college. And I, I plan on giving a public announcement, making a public announcement next week. Um, but I just want everyone to really realize we are going to definitely err on the side of caution. And through this whole process, um, as we start bringing people back to campus, um, we never know, things might change along the way. So this is an evolving pandemic. The responses are evolving. So sometimes the decisions that we make today in three weeks can be the wrong ones. We might have to come back and revisit those suggestions. So I guess the sign of good leadership at a time like this is flexibility and weighing all the alternatives as we move forward. So I wanna thank the board for your assistance and I look forward to talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, President Blanca. Okay, we're moving on to tab J under old business. Um, let's see. I would like to entertain a motion to amend the agenda and make tab J an action item. Do I hear a motion? So moved, Ruha Hatcher. Okay, CMG. second. Devard, second. Okay. Um, any, well, maybe we should let VP Johnson comment on this. Would you like to tell us some tidbits here? Great, thank you. Um, so this really, we are bringing this, this motion to the board um, in, reaction and response to the anticipation that a lot of our fall courses uh, are gonna be taught in distance learning mode versus to be on campus. Uh, and while we're finalizing that, that schedule, we, 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 we do believe there's gonna be a, a, a lot more choices for students for distance learning. Um, and when you look at our tuition rates, and that's what this, the uh, motion provides in the discussion section, 
um, back in April, the board had approved our tuition rates. Uh, and, and you will note that for our in-district students, the uh, on-campus rate is about $13 per credit hour lower than the distance learning rate at $108. Um, and that is the only rate category to where um, the distance learning rate is higher than the on-campus rate. And so the recommendation that we're bringing to the board is that, that we really don't want to, um, students to have to choose um, based upon financial consequences. We, we would like for our in-district students to take the financial consequence of being forced to take a distance learning course um, to be at the same rate as if they were taking an on-campus course. And so the motion is, is that we were to revise solely for the fall 2020 semester, because we're all hope, hopeful that our course schedule for winter can return back to uh, kind of the normal distribution of on-campus and DL. But for fall 2020, that we would revise the in-district rate down from what is approved at $108, uh, the in-district DL rate down from $108 down to $95. And also there are two other rate categories to which we would make that same amendment. And that is for out of district students who have either, either work in district or have property in district, uh, we've always had that, that symmetry between uh, the uh, those rates being charged for work in district and property district to be the same rates as in district. So we would recommend that we would extend that same rate reduction for fall down to $95 for those rate categories as well. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so first we are voting to make this an actionable item. Are there any questions first? on tuition rates. I'm going to speak in favor of this, but should I wait until we move it to the agenda? Um, I guess either way, it doesn't matter. You can go ahead and speak to it now if you want. OK. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the staff for their thoughtful foresight in putting this on our table. Um, it's an anomaly that I noticed and thought about. And I actually have had students, a couple students, call me about this because they won't they're anticipating not being able to take an in-person course and worried about the additional cost of having to do it in distance learning i think this is respectful of our taxpayers who uh, are so generous in supporting the college with half of our budget basically and it recognizes the situation that we find ourselves in where People who want to do things in person may be forced to do it uh, online. And uh, it acknowledges that and re reduces the rate, just as uh, Vice President Johnson said, these are the only categories where the distance learning rates are uh, more expensive than the in-person on-campus rates. And I think this was very uh, thoughtful of the staff to put this on our table. Um, I strongly it support kind of grovel, it. Doesn't it? Yeah. I strongly support it and encourage us to move it to the agenda today and to pass it. Thank you. Any other uh, comments on the tuition adjustment? Uh, I just have one question, um, and maybe we don't know the answer yet. Do we have a sense of how that would impact the budget for next year? Thank you, Trustee Hatcher. It is, uh, it's uh, based upon last last fall's distribution of in-district uh, DL ver versus on-campus. It, it, it would be about $130,000 reduction to tuition revenue. Okay. Well, I, th I'm, I think it's a good idea. I just wondered what the effect would be. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board questions? Okay, so we're first going to vote to make this an actionable item. Um, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milligan. Vice Chair Mill Milligan, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary Devardi. Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. 
Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. We're still on tab J. We now need to pass the motion. The recommendation. Yeah, um, excuse me. The recommendation as follows, in recognition that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic will impact the college's fall 2020 on-campus course offerings, and in further consideration of the potential financial impact that this may have on in-district students, <coughs> the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the revision to the distance learning tuition rates for in-district, work in-district, and property in-district from 108 per credit hour to 95 per credit hour for the fall 2020 semester. Do I hear a motion to approve? McKnight, Morton, so move. And a second? Party second. second. Thank you. Any further discussions on the tuition rates? Okay, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We are now on tab K. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve a three year contract for internet connectivity with DDoS protection, that's distributed denial of service, from merit for an amount not to exceed 78,000. Do I hear a motion to approve? Millican so moves. A second? Davis support. Okay, are there any questions on the internet connectivity upgrade? Okay, hearing none. Um, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. We are now on tab L, the general fund operating budget. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-21 budget plan as submitted. Do I hear a motion to approve? Davis, so move. A second? I've already second. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? Uh, VP Johnson, do you want to highlight anything here? No? You're muted. <laughs> thank you. This still, uh, this still reflects the level of uncertainty on, on the revenue side um, for enrollment and for state aid and some of our ancillary business. And we are presenting a uh, cost structure that still allows us to achieve the strategies of the college and still provide for a balanced budget. Any questions on the general fund from the board? <laughs> I, have, I have a comment. Okay, Ruth, go ahead. Um, I think now I believe in miracles. Okay. I can't hear. Oh, you can't hear me? No. I can hear you, Ruth. You, well, now you muted. <laughs> you need to unmute now. Okay. okay, I hear you. Okay. Did you hear my comment? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Any other comments on the general fund? Okay, thank you. Um, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty. Yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, moving on to new business. We are now on tab M. First is the Circle In contract. Uh, VP Blakey, would you like to comment here? Yes, I actually have a PowerPoint presentation for this. Okay. Sorry. Do I have control? I know. 
Sorry. Yeah, this is an interesting. You, you, you so we know that student engagement is a key component of student success. Um, and prior, even prior to COVID-19, the college we've seen um, an increasing numbers of students enrolling in online classes. Um, certainly due to COVID-19, all of our winter 2020 classes had to transition um, to online mode in March. And our, as you know, all of our summer classes have transitioned to an online format. And we know that many st students like to study in groups. Um, we have college organized study groups for many of our STEM courses and other areas. But be, when you're on campus, there's also lots of student organized study groups across many subject areas. And you'll see them in the library, across the campus, they'll see in, be in the lobby of um, Student Center, um, studying in groups of two to eight um, on different subject areas. Not being able to gather and study on campus is, um, we feel, is a barrier to student success. Circle In is an app that we've become aware of. It's easy to use, and it's a website where, an app and a website where students can study together online. So whether they're local or, you know, live many distances apart, it allows them to study together. They can seek help from their classmates. They can share class notes. Think about when if you went to class and maybe you weren't able to get to class and you can ask a classmate for, hey, can I look at your notes from that particular class? It allows students to do that easily through the app. And they can also get help because tutors are embedded in the app as well. It allows ready access to students who are enrolled in their class sections. So Circle N was a recipient of a 2019 National Science Foundation Innovation Grant titled the Smart Study Recommendations Engine. It's received additional support through private funding to support the work and uh, measure the improvements in student success and also make, um, it's also always doing updates to the tool. Um, Circle N is fully deployed on a, a select number of campuses, including the ones listed on this graph. So I think I'll just go through a series of slides. The big misunderstanding is that studying does not have to be done in person. When the lecture ends, it doesn't mean that mastery for all students. Um, students sometimes have to go through, back over um, the lecture, back over their notes. Um, every day after class, students struggle and face difficulties. Sometimes it's awkward to ask a stranger to become a study buddy. And it's also painful to admit, I don't get it. Circle in is easy to use, and it's where students listen and help their classmates. So they'll never feel alone when struggling after class. Um, students who reach out and help can earn rewards, and it's super easy to connect to, again, the students that are in their class. So it, it allows students to meet where they are. Are they on campus? They can still use the tool. If they're taking a hybrid, a mixed online or on campus, or fully online, it doesn't matter. It allows students to study together no matter what mode the classes are in. So an example is Josh posts a question. He now to class commits can then provide immediate help. Does anyone help, you know, understand practice question number four? Then students, he may be shy to ask that question, but he does that on the app and then other students or tutors can jump in and help. So we also, again, this is an update on the tool since we first looked at it. It embeds the tutors that we have provide through our learning support area, uh, through the library, and supplemental instructors to help with student issues during appointment downtime. So for faculty, they can see, we can also provide a report on what was the top 20 questions that were issued. Um, so that would give feedback to the instructors. Maybe I didn't cover that topic as well as I thought, because there's many students asking questions on that particular area. They also can um, study the notes. Some students are better note takers than other. So she can review the notes. The notes can be shared by students with other students in their class. So they can, again, see material that they might have missed or not understood as well. There's no inappropriate post. Um, image detection will find that. It also, only students who are, law, who are enrolled in the particular section have access to the tool. So because it requires um, their WCC email to sign in, 
and they have to use the real name. So they can't use kind of a false identity um, when they're uploading their notes or sharing information with other students. So it allows for inclusive study. They can, um, it also gives them ideas of, they can search and view what influencers have shared, um, what study cards they're using or study habits they're using for a particular exam that's coming up. It also displays to students the highest rated study resources by the most helpful classmates. So it doesn't, they don't have to worry about conflicts or commuting. Again, they don't have to worry about being able to come to campus. They're able to study in groups of one on one to one or in larger issues if they need to. Students can also do study groups on particular topics within the class. And also we can have TAs or excuse me, tutors lead specific topic areas if they find the students are struggling on a particular area. So students for on institutions that have been using the circle and tool, they found that 66% of the students experienced an increase in productivity in their classes. 64% um, report by having more confidence in their ability to pass the class. It resulted in 80% better academic performance for the students who use the tool. And 71% of the students recommend circle in to their classmates. Um, students can also use Circle In. So we would be integrating Circle In into Blackboard. So all of our classes are in Blackboard. All the classes have a Blackboard shell. And so Circle In would just be embedded into Blackboard. So what can we do with the data once we have it? It gives us a sense of besides just the grade, um, we can also see the amount of time that students are studying or using the tool and give us predictions on student success. So the National Science Foundation grant is also, um, it's measuring um, classes where students have high um, DFW course rates and looking at retention increases for students and in institutions that are using this tool. So the Circle Lens site license is $119,000. Due to the support of private funders and the NSF grant, a $25,000 grant would be provided in year one, resulting in the total cost being $94,000. A $15,000 grant would be provided in year two, dropping the cost down to $104,000. We have determined that the first year of the site license would be covered by our institutional CARES grant, because again, with the classes, um, most of our classes going into an online format, that's a, a change in campus operations, which is things that the institutional CARES grant will cover. We plan to have Circle in app if it's approved, available in all of our courses enrolled in fall 2020. Um, this is a board discussion item. Um, excuse me, I thought I was presenting at the beginning of the meeting, so um, ignore that last comment. Okay. This is, is a discussion item, um, and hopefully, we'll <coughs> voted on at the July meeting. Okay. Um, VP Blakey, are you okay with that timeline to get this implemented if we vote on it in July? I can make that work. If you'd like to vote on it t t today, that would be fine also, but I can make the July work, but I would, yes, either way I will make it work. Okay. Um, any questions from the board here? I have a question. Go ahead, Dave. So you say the first year is likely to be covered our part of the cost by the CARES Act funding. Are we committing to more than one year with this, if we do it? We would be, um, I wanted to give you, we've been given the cost for three years. Right. Um, we always have, we're not committing to a full three years. We can evaluate on a year by year basis for the tool. So we basically get the chance to evaluate it after the first year and say, oh, this is great, let's keep it, or we could back out if it's not working. That is correct. I see no reason to not do it. I, I, I think we should definitely do it. Okay, any other board comments on this? Well, uh, yeah, I wish I had that when I was going through school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, how, how's, how's it that it didn't come 
materialize at that time, but that, that's a long time ago. But in any case, I think I, I agree with my colleague, uh, Gabardi, that uh, this is an excellent, when I read it, I just like, oh my goodness, this is excellent for our students. And for because that's all we are supposed to be doing is trying to make sure that they, they succeed and are successful. So I, I agree with you uh, that um, I'd be glad to vote on it today if that's uh, agreeable. I can I make a motion? Go ahead, Dave. I'd like to move to amend the agenda to move this to an action item. Okay, do I hear a second for that motion? Second. Okay, so the, um, the motion is to make this an actionable item. Any discussion on making it an actionable item? Any reason not to? Okay, hearing none. Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Thank you for voting. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Uh, we might have lost her. Trustee oh. Hatcher? Ruth, you're muted. Trustee, Trustee Hatcher, yes. Thank Trustee you. Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Now we need to vote um, on the motion. So do I hear a motion to pass this? I move that we, I move that, uh, we accept to pass this. Okay, second. second. And a second. Any discussion, any further discussion on circle N? I, I, Hatcher, um, yep. this is for one year we're voting? Correct. Okay. And so we, um, I look forward to a report on on how well this liked it, how many used it, and how the faculty liked it uh, this time next year. Sounds reasonable. Any other board questions or comments? Okay. Um, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. No, wait, wait. Oh, wait, what? This rose. I just want to make sure it's for one year. It's, it sounds for, I'm just saying, yes, it is. Is this one year, Bill? So, uh, uh, this is, uh, so the contract that we have is um, a uh, one year contract with the, with, the with the right to renew for two exceeding years at the prices uh, that EVP Blakey out outlined. Uh, and so actually the, the motion asked for the board to approve the first year contract with the renewal rights that we have in the contract. Well, wow, so you're asking for more than one year. Yes. I, you know, I want to make sure the board understands that. Okay. Is everybody clear on the circle in contract and what we're voting for? Okay. Um, Vanessa, well, Ruth, please. Ruth's oh. the one who asked the question. I just oh, want to make sure. Uh, uh, there's there's still an option for not renewing the second and third year. That's Correct. All. Yeah. Yeah. So after the end of one year, they will evaluate it to determine if it's worthwhile. Right. Right. So they just have the option of renewing. Right. It was clear in the in the uh, description. Okay. Okay. Are, are you comfortable with that, Ruth? Yes, I am. Okay. Hi, uh, McKnight Morton. Okay. Uh, my question is. Um, Maybe I, it was said, but I, I didn't hear it. If we, if we go ahead with this one year, with this price, does the price increase for the two and three years, or this is that three years is part of this one year? Does the price change? Can anybody address that? So as, as, the, uh, as the recommendation out, outlines, the first year cost would be 94000 and then it does increase to 104,000 in the second year and then 119 in the third year. Um, okay, if I may. So, so that's that's what was you know in the proposal. So I just wanted to make sure that um, I was I got kind of confused if if uh, uh, the three years is part of one price, but it's, it's each year's separate prices. I understand. Correct. Right. Correct. So if I may, Madam Chair, go ahead. I am very supportive of this because it, you know, engaging students is critical to their success. 
I just want to make sure the board understands what they're voting on. That's really important to me that that's very clear. So that's the only reason I brought that up. Not because I'm, I'm not supportive. Oh, no, definitely. I, and Go ahead, Dave. I, I mean, it's clear. The recommendation is clear. It's explicit. Um, it authorizes three years. It says the college administration will base the contract renewal on student use and evaluation of the Circle in app. So it gives us an out if it doesn't work. Um, I, I trust the administration. This is um, a very, very small investment in a tremendous opportunity to increase student success. And I can't, I, I just don't see a reason not to do this. I, I strongly support it. Okay. Here, here. Any other board comments before we vote? Okay, thank you. Uh, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you, everybody. We are now on Chair, tab Chair, N. Chair Fleming? And oh, yeah, Morton, go ahead. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we are now on tab N, which is the Campus Elevator Upgrade Project. Um, VP Johnson, would you like to give us any highlights here? Sure, thank you. Um, so we, uh, one of those critical projects that I mentioned earlier that we uh, needed to find fund, uh, funding for was the control systems on a number of our elevators are just hit the end of life and really need to be updated and that will, that will enhance um, the, the um, liability of the elevators. And uh, this is an, op, an opportune time for us to get after this project in, in that we don't have our normal presence on, on campus. Um, we, uh, we use the U.S. Communities per, uh, Purchasing Consortium as one venue for looking for service contracts that meet our needs. And Kone was the firm that uh, won, won that, that bid through the U.S. Communities per, uh, Purchasing Consortium and we're asking the board to approve a contract with Kone for $335,000 to cover the elevator uh, control updates for the BE, SC, LA, and GM building. Okay. Any questions for VP Johnson here? I... I have a question. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, Vice President Johnson, this says it takes five to six months to order the parts. If we moved and accepted this now, could it be done in the fall when there's likely to be no activity on on campus? We we uh, we actually uh, we anticipate so that so what what I've written is that they, that we'll have it done within five five to six months of ordering parts. So yes, so that so the sooner that we uh, have an approved contract, um, the sooner that we can yeah. helpful. This is another one I I see a benefit to if we're in favor of this, I see a benefit to doing it now to allow us to get this in before uh, winter term. Um, so I would, I would like to move to make this an action item on tonight's agenda. Okay, is there a second to make this an action item? Second. Okay, any discussion on making this an action item? Is anybody, does anybody think it's not a good idea to take action on the elevator upgrade? No, good thinking. Good thinking, okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna uh, vote to approve this as an action item. So uh, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Muted. Ruth, you're muted. Yeah, it, it goes out by itself. Hatcher, yes. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight, McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. We have now made this an action item. Do I hear a motion to approve the recommendation? I move we approve this recommendation. 
We like Second. supports. Support, okay. Any further discussion on the recommendation? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Secretary DeVardi? DeVardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. We are now on tab O, the Gunder Myron Building HVAC controls. Um, VP Johnson, do you want to highlight anything here for us? Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, the campus is largely a Siemens uh, building automation con control campus. Uh, one of the main buildings that's not is the Gunder Myron building uh, that was chosen many years ago, of course, originally to put in a Honeywell system. And they've now hit their end, end of life. Uh, and it, it's going to require some updating. Um, the recommendation is, is that, that we take this opportunity during this updating process uh, to convert the building automation systems for Gunder Myron building uh, from the Honeywell system to a semen based system. Uh, it is for greater integration. Single pane of glass, we're now able, once this is done, to be able to control in an integrated basis all of our key buildings uh, systems, including our HVAC systems. Uh, and secondly, it will provide for uh, greater reliability. Many of you might know uh, we've had a, a, uh, an ongoing issue uh, with the HVAC um, systems in the, Gun the Gunder Myron building. Many of those are mechanical in nature, but part of it's related to the control systems itself. So this what has been on our deferred maintenance list. Uh, and once again, since the Gunder Myron building is, is going to be uh, largely uh, unoccupied for at least a while here, uh, that we're able to uh, get after this project. So the recommendation is uh, that we award a contract with Siemens. And this will be a sole source contract with Siemens, given um, that Siemens is the only provider of these control systems. Okay. Uh, any questions for VP Johnson? Yes, VP Johnson, after the installation is complete, then is Siemens the sole um, maintenance party for the system, or are there third parties that can maintain it once it's in place? There, there are, uh, Trustee uh, Milliken, there are, there are third, third party con, con contractors um, for, the, uh, for the mechanical elements of it, but the, but the control systems themselves are proprietary, uh, and it's important that we continue to leverage our, our ongoing uh, Siemens maintenance contracts um, with this system as well. So you're comfortable with the control that they'll exert over us, that's correct? I am. I, once the campus made, made this decision years ago to be a Siemens-based system, um, we, we were getting all the benefits that go with that, but also, as you correctly point out, the risk uh, that you're then largely reliant upon the performance and service of uh, one service provider. Understood. Any other questions on this? <clears throat> VP Johnson, are you okay with the timeline on this if we approve it in July? I am, yes. You are? Okay. All right, then we will go on to uh, the next tab. Tab P, the faculty sabbaticals. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the requested 2020-21 faculty sabbatical leaves as submitted. Do I hear a motion to approve? Ignite Morton approve, uh, so, support. excuse me, support. <laughs> uh, a second, please. Do I hear a second for the faculty? <laughs> Party support. Thank you. Okay, any discussions on the faculty sabbaticals? Any questions? Uh, McKnight Morton, I, I felt in reading all of their narratives for each one, um, every, each one has a very valid reason 
and and has a um, supportive documentation of what they are trying to uh, accomplish in their sabbatical. And as far as I'm concerned, I think it would be a, a privilege and, and a great um, justice for us to hear each one in what they have done on their time off. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions or discussion on the faculty sabbaticals? <clears throat> okay, hearing none. Uh, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Trustee Hatcher. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Um, last but not least, tab Q. Q is the revision to our 2020 schedule of monthly board meetings. Oh, let's see, where am I? There we are. Okay, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees revise their 2020 schedule of monthly board meetings and begin the July 28th meeting at 1 p.m. Do I hear a motion to support this? Like Morton support. Okay, a second, I think I, I heard a first and a second there. Was that Milliken seconding? Either way. Okay. Um, any discussion on changing the schedule for our meeting? Any questions? My question, um, McKnight Morton here. Uh, my question is, if we, um, let me ask you this. This is for July, but we're, so we're going to be looking at what's going to happen in September for our, in forward of what uh, days and times and how we're going to meet, campus or virtual? So if I understand, is your question, have we made a decision yet on September? No, not have we made a decision, but it's like, what is it? What does it look like? And I know I'm just supposing that Rose may be talking to us, but what would our board meetings look like beginning in September on for the days and times? Is it going to be in person or virtual? We don't. Um, may I? Go ahead. But I think Dave's got the answer. <laughs> um, we don't really know right now. It's a sub to the governor. And so it's, you know, it, that's where we're waiting to hear. And so if she continues to um, say that we should have online meetings that we're allowed to do that, it will be online. We might, that might not happen. And we'll just wait and see what she says. And maybe by the end of July, we'll have that answer. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Belanca. I'm asking for the, uh, for uh, people who may be listening and may have that question, seeing how we are uh, adjusting our our board meeting for July, um, and you know, just they may just have that question or thought of what's going to happen in September. So that's why sure. I brought it up. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on um, changing our schedule for just July? Okay. Hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Trustee Hatcher. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, adjournment of the meeting. Um, do I hear a motion? So move. Adjourn. Moved. Uh, second? Second. Second. Devardi. Devardi second. Any discussion before we adjourn? All right, hearing none. Vanessa. Good meeting. Oh, thank you, Diana. Okay. <laughs> uh, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. 
Secretary Devardi. Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned.